Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start here in a few moments. Uh, some uh, upsetting news, in a way. Uh, the shake is right there at the Stewart exit, but there is a massive accident on the turnpike. And they're saying it won't be cleared until 1.30 or 1.45. So we may have to roll without the shake, but I am a person of faith. You all are people of faith, so God will provide. Jehovah Jireh, I thoroughly believe in his power to lead us right through this. In the meantime, um, I'd like to, while the other gentlemen are coming up, tell you a little story that I made up to illustrate the problem of all the dilemmas that we're facing, whether it's in the Middle East or on college campuses, or deciding what uh, you do when you don't have a shake in the room. <laughs> Imagine that Father Joe and Sheikh Shafayat and Rabbi Matthew had been called in to consider and pray about a problem that was besetting all of Southeast Florida. The entire landscape of the Treasure Coast was being attacked by weevils. Golf courses, lawns, shrubbery, flowers, Everything was being stripped bare. It was as though a plague of locusts had come through. But Rabbi Matthew had done some research, and he had discovered two weevils, and he was pretty convinced that one of them was responsible for the damage. He showed these two specimens to Father Joe and to Sheikh Shafayet on a little tray, and both examined the weevils, but they came up with the same response. He said, they look exactly alike. There's no difference between them. But Rabbi Matthew, being very resourceful, gave them both magnifying glasses. And they scrutinized these bugs carefully and determined that the one on the right-hand side of the tray must be the culprit because he was a little bigger, a little more heft and breadth. And so that's the one they chose as being the insect in question. And at this point, Rabbi Matthew slammed his hand on the table and said, gotcha. As men of faith, don't you know that you have to choose the lesser of two weevils? <laughs> Just remember that. Words of wisdom. I thank you all for coming out. Uh, and I think you know our panel. I've just mentioned who they are, except Father Joe Shepley is here filling the considerable shoes of Father Christian. Yeah. Thank you. And you know Rabbi Matthew from Temple Beit Hayam, and this reminds me of, who was that actor who gestured to the empty chair? Uh, Clint Eastwood in, in some debate. And this is Sheikh Shafayet. Uh, we have had many, many questions submitted uh, right up until the moment before we started today. A number of them were off topic. I guess I didn't make it clear that we were trying to focus on the two topics that we have covered in the last two weeks about patriarchy and the role of the faiths in uh, proposing and promoting patriarchy, true or false, and about violence uh, being promoted by the Abrahamic faiths, true or false. So I had to do a bit of triage. Uh, a lot of your questions concerned the Middle East, uh, and many of them were directed to the sheikh, so we're going to have to just roll with what we have here. In the context of last week's discussion, of our faiths and them being the single greatest factor in promoting violence and war, was that true? We spoke of the violence taking place in the Middle East and which is roiling our universities and colleges here at home. So many of you wrote in about those two issues. And I wanted to ask both gentlemen, because a number of people have wondered what strategies whether media, political, social, or other, our faiths might employ, and have been employing, to promote greater mutual understanding and diplomatic, peaceful solutions to the problems that divide us. 
And since the Sheikh isn't here to address that, I will tell you that if you go online to the Al Hikmat, H I K M A T, center in Pembroke Pines, if you look that up on the web, you'll see that he and his group have been engaged in all kinds of interfaith ministries. You may not know that he has a TV station that broadcasts internationally, so you all have been seen in Trinidad and India and all kinds of places because he's uh, publicized our Lunch and Learn series. And I'm sure he would tell you much more about it, but in the meantime, uh, I know that Father Joe and Rabbi Matthew have been involved in interfaith work for some time. So, Father Joe, you tell us first, and, and we'll then turn to Rabbi Matthew. Sure, well, thank you. It's a deep honor to be with you on this stage, Matthew, Darcy. And <laughs> thank you. May Sheikh be here in God's time. I'm thankful to um, address this question, and I'll begin by talking about a relationship that I've had throughout my life with what could be called an interfaith family experience. And ultimately, everything we do is about relationships, our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, and relationships are key, and I'm grateful for this openness and this platform where we can be in relationship together. I grew up in an interfaith family in the sense that my beloved Aunt Josephine converted to Judaism when she met the love of her life, and so from my earliest memories, we were both Christian and, in a sense, Jewish. We celebrated all those holidays together, and of course, as a child, I thought to myself, what's not to love? More presents and great food. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very positive, life-giving experience for me in every way, and it continues to be as I've been involved in my family with the recognition of certain holidays, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, an ongoing, not dialogue, but relationship. So it's a, it's a mm. lived experience for me in terms of Christianity and Judaism. And I think that certainly informed my own vocational path as a Christian priest. I will say that when it came to Islam, uh, the only thing I really knew about Islam was what I studied about it in divinity school, where I notably... Um, recognized the, the fundamental differences as well as the commonalities. And there are some significant theological differences that perhaps at another time we could talk about. Um, but I, I certainly saw common ground, but not as much as I saw with Judaism based upon my lived experience. Uh, so when I served a parish in New York City, that was really my first exposure to a dialogue of both Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. As I was invited to take part on a panel much like this at a temple called Emmanuel Temple on Fifth Avenue, which at the time was led by Rabbi Sobel, who was a groundbreaking figure in his own right in having started interfaith dialogues mm. in New York City in the 1970s. So I joined this panel and soon realized that I was now in relationship with an imam. But shortly after that, 9-11 occurred, and that really brought that dialogue to a halt. And I had a very um, deep experience with 9-11 as a first responder at Ground Zero and found myself, like a lot of people in New York City at that time, feeling a deep sense of alienation from Islam. And that's a very complex issue, admittedly. But at the time, it was so raw that this invitation to a relationship for me had definitely been put on hold. Mm. Um, it was only by traveling uh, abroad that I began to re-engage what it looks like to see Islamic and Christianity communities working together. I saw that in East Africa, and I could say more about that, but I'll, I'll say at this point that I'm delighted to be in dialogue again, having gone through a process of deeper understanding. It sounds like healing is taking yes. place. That's great. Rabbi Matthew. So I would say, uh, <clears throat> much like Father Joe, I, I too also grew up in a mixed family. Uh, my mother grew up Orthodox, and my father grew up classically Reformed. When they got together, you know, it, it was always interesting. My mother grew up uh, very traditional, um, in a very, very Orthodox home. And when my parents got together, my mother had said, I really could care less what you eat. Cut <laughs> fruit was not important to them. What was important was family. What was important was celebrating Shabbat. Hmm. What was important was the values and the ethics that they brought forward. So I grew up in a, uh, for many of you that, that, that know, I grew up in a very large city. I grew up in the city of Toronto, um, which at that time had hundreds of thousands of Jews. We have hundreds of thousands of Muslims and obviously um, and Christians. And I grew up in, in this bubble. I grew up in this bubble of a 
Jewish upbringing. And really cosmopolitan, too. Yes. You know, we're a, we're a smaller, cleaner, friendlier New York City. <laughs> what we tend to pride ourselves on. Um, <clears throat> but in and of itself, you know, when I went to high school, uh, which uh, Father Anderson will, will certainly poke fun of, I went to an Anglican high school. My well, high school was founded in 1829. It was inaugurated by then, the, the King of England. Um, we have a lot of these traditions that I was, I was always brought up with. When I was in high school, I always struggled. And it was because every morning, we would have to do prayers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can recite to you the Lord's Prayer, because we had to recite it every single day. And I remember um, fairly early on in high school, going to the administration and saying, but there's a lot of us that are Jewish here. We don't really feel comfortable saying the Lord's Prayer. Is there something else that we could do to know of it? And they refused. I, I, I think the only thing that made concessions for Jews was, well, we'll allow you not to kneel. Hmm. So when you have 600 students and 550 are kneeling, it's not hard to find which one's the Jew. But maybe you could do what Hannah did and just move your lips. <laughs> I think many of us did do that. But it opened my eyes, really, to a world that was very different than the world I grew up in. I, mean, I grew up in a part of the city which was notoriously for Jews. Um, not that we interact, that we were so insular, but I had the opportunity to have a wide range of experiences. And it was amazing. Um, and I think my first exposure, really, to interfaith work was when I was in high school and I was in uh, university, where the churches and the synagogues and the mosques within the city of Toronto started a program about 30-some-odd years ago. And the program they started, which is still in existence, is called Out of the Cold Program. And the way that it works was they took the homeless, and every single week, whether it be a synagogue, it would, it would alternate between a synagogue, the church, the mosque, and they would bring in the homeless, they would feed them, they would serve them, and they would house them. And then by the end of the next day, they would give them a bus token and to be able to go back on their way and another one for wherever they happened to go. And it, it, it literally from day after day after day moved from churches in the area to the synagogues to the mosques. And I remember looking at the, at the great love that people shared of helping others in their midst. And I remember saying to myself, this isn't about Judaism. Mm -hmm. This isn't about Islam. This isn't about Christianity. What it is is about the values we all share of taking care of others if and how we can. And that really shaped it. When I was in college, I also invested myself. Uh, Toronto has a Jewish healing project, which is to bring comfort and solace for those who have lost loved ones and members of their family or friends or relatives or members of the community. Some were premature, some were um, passed away early, and others of just trying to find that healing, that sense of healing. Uh, and I remember leading a few services that was really difficult for people who had lost sons or daughters or um, parents. And I remember saying, I don't know if I have the right language. And I was really struck by that. Hmm. And Because you were a man of many words, usually. Yes. <laughs> but then it also manifests itself when I, when I went to rabbinical school. Um, I went to rabbinical school in an Anglican country. I, Went to school in London. I was trained as a British rabbi. We do a lot of interfaith work. And let me just interject here that you've been doing it here as well with the Sheikh and others, um, as has Father Christian. What I'd like to hear is, going forward, some ideas that either both of you have for greater interfaith work, and a questioner asked, is, are there other venues in this area where 
interfaith work is being done. So I, I, oh, wait, I, I, I'll, I'll let Father uh, Joe go. But, but, you know, it's interesting. Um, and, and many of you have been part of this entire process since day one. I'm losing it already. You see what happens. I should be wearing the shirt. Um, <laughs> exactly. That will never happen, Matthew. <laughs> But there's, there's something that, you know, b beyond my relationship, beyond with St. Mary's, and certainly with um, uh, the congregation, the community, and with, with Father Anderson, there was something that became really important for me. And that is when we started these Lunch and Learn series. And we started at Temple Beit Hayam. We had an interfaith dialogue between Father Anderson and myself, for those that remember, in the sanctuary. And then we kind of went on hiatus a little bit. And although we did 161 episodes of a podcast and a radio program, my vision was I want this to be almost like the Greek festival or Stewart's Seafood Festival, right? Stewart's Interfaith Lunch and Learn series. I wanted it to be a staple in our community. And I am proud to say that after a few years now, if we take a look around this room, We have created a venue. As I had said to Father Anderson, I want a spring series at the temple. I want a fall series at St. Mary's. And we've done it. And I think going forward, if we keep increasing, we certainly can't use our spaces anymore. I mean, take a look. We're almost filled to the gills. A temple, same thing. And, and for those that remember last year, this was, I mean, a classic example. We had 40 reservations. 160 people showed up through our doors. Okay? And then we increased from 160 to 200 to, you know, the last five series that we did where we had 250. It's amazing. That's where interfaith work lies, is in our ability to challenge one another, not in the sense of proselytization or let me, let me tell you so you can think differently and come to whatever realization it may be, but as to giving us knowledge. You know, I had always said to Father Anderson, I mean no disrespect, but I'm really struggling. I took Christianity in rabbinical school. Uh, for those that know, uh, her name, Karen Armstrong. I don't know if you're familiar with Karen Armstrong. She was a former nun. Um, I was taught Christianity by her for two years. It's important we learn about one another. So I'd always said to Father Anderson, I don't mean any disrespect, but I, I really want to challenge you. And I really want to go beyond just the pleasantries. And we've engaged in really difficult conversations. But all of that could not have been possible if it were not for, and in this context, with the Sheikh, with St. Mary's, of an open and honest dialogue. There's trust. There is um, a great mutual respect for one another. And, and that's how this has really come full circle of we can engage in difficult conversations. And that happens around the table. It's not just top down, these gentlemen talking to one another. But you all are mixing it up, and I think that's, that's the ground is one another talking and, and getting on board with those difficult questions. Uh, question again is, are there other places, other venues that you know of that are doing anything like this where you could meet up with? No, okay. Then we... We're the initiators, we're the instigators. I know the Episcopal Diocese of Southeast Florida, of which we're a part, has interfaith movements within it. I think this certainly has the promise to be one of the leading voices. And I think listening to each other is key, which is clearly how this whole opportunity has been forged. And I think ongoing listening is important to hear the story of the other, especially one who's been marginalized or overlooked. Um, that's part of the healing process, for sure. You mentioned healing before. You know, from my experience, to be very transparent with you, just as I was getting on board in terms of opening up to an imam and realizing that unity is not uniformity, you know, we can still have our differences, uh, deeply held theological beliefs, and still be together in relationship, which is a very compelling and powerful way to live. 
which is to realize that we can be together in peace and get along, even if our worldview might be coming from different perspectives. And as we listen to each other, we learn. And that's what this is about. You know, for me, after September 11th, and that was a long time ago, admittedly, a lot of things have happened in our lives since then. Uh, but I was amazed, in a sense, but not surprised also at how quickly that interfaith panel was put on hold because the emotions were just so mm. raw. We just were not able to be in that space of listening. And for me, I left parish ministry in the traditional sense after that to dedicate myself full-time to a ministry dedicated to those that had survived 9-11, who were dealing with substance abuse issues and questions of faith. It was the 2030 generation that I at the time represented. And one of the real pieces that I picked up on was the intense anger born out of grief of what had happened and how blame was being cast upon the other, in this case, Islam. And over the course of many years, through interviews and listening, I discovered that Islam is much more complex than just a category or a label. And when I traveled to East Africa and saw Muslims and Christians living together in the villages very closely, I could see the clear differences, but I could also see points of commonality. And I think the thing that I really experienced most of all was the power of listening. Just listening to the story of another, getting a sense of where they've come from, not judging somebody until you've really walked in their shoes, and maybe you never will. And to say to them, oh, I know exactly how you feel. We know that's not how the healing process works. It's better to say, I can't imagine what it's like to be you, or that must really hurt. And so for me, you know, the healing process of beginning to trust that worldview uh, was a journey. Uh, our son now lives in the United Arab Emirates, and my wife, Mother Tara, and I went over there earlier this year, and we were exposed to his community, heavily Islamic, from different nationalities. And it really opened up my eyes, and I did a lot of listening, and I'm still processing everything we experienced. And so, you know, based on what I said earlier, I'm very comfortable with Judaism. It's been part of my family. I want to become more comfortable with Islam. I am becoming that way. Um, I've done a lot of studying, but in terms of the experiential connections, this is now happening. I'm really grateful to be on the stage with you and hopefully with Sheikh in the future. But it's important, I think, for us to realize that listening is part of healing, and we are a divided world, and there are no easy solutions, but let it begin with us by listening and brokering peace as we're able to in a safe place, and this is certainly that. And I thank you all for what you've established here that I've had the privilege to simply walk into, which is this groundbreaking, incredible interfaith opportunity for love. I will say also that uh, we've been facilitating a program, as many of you know, called Sacred Ground, which bridges the divide between black and white. And we've been having that um, over at St. Paul AME Church. And we've had tremendous dialogue around the table, but it was all based on that building up of trust because no white person has experienced what a black person has and vice versa. So the listening is absolutely key, just holding a story, that sacred story that each person has to tell about themselves and learning from it. And you just build incrementally. You just keep at it. Uh, I'd like to turn now to the question of what is going on on college campuses and universities uh, over this war in Gaza. Many of you wrote in asking the clergy to comment on it, not that they are experts, and this is really a choice of lesser of two weevils, what in the world you do on a college campus. So, Rabbi Matthew? I know it's... So what to say about what's going on college campuses is it is wildly out of control. Mm. It is out of control. On the one hand, I do understand, look, we send our kids to colleges and universities because we want our children to think for themselves, to critically think for themselves, and to form an ideology and an opinion for themselves and based solely where they are. What we're seeing now is, in some way, almost the complete opposite. I don't agree with what's going on in the Middle East, and therefore I'm going to raise my voice in, in protest against institutions or organizations that support 
right? We look at Columbia, we can look at UCLA, we can look at virtually almost every college campus, and we see that there is a great division. My challenge, and forgive me, my challenge is why is it that Israel has a different standard around the world mm. than any other nation or people who exist on this planet? We don't happen to see the UN come in and reprimand Syria or Lebanon or Iran, Iraq. But yet, we see everything with Israel done in a very stern, political, and very challenging way. And, pl and please don't misconstrue my words. I am not saying that Israel is a perfect utopia. I have said this from the pulpit in my own congregation. I feel very strongly with this. I might not always agree with the policies or the tactics that a state of Israel takes. However, I will always support Israel. I love Israel. My heart as a Jew, I can honestly and openly say, as a Jew, my loyalty and my allegiance is to the state of Israel. However, I, my heart can also be broken and pain, visceral pain, for the loss of life of the Palestinians who are caught in a conflict to which there is no, uh, there is no stability. However, what we're seeing on these college campuses in some way, I believe, again, this is just my own conjecture, what I see is a misrepresentation of the facts of what's going on. And, it, and it's a minority, a tiny minority of these kids who are trying to graduate, trying to study, who are not being allowed to do so. They may not even have a graduation. These are young people, I will say, who grew up thinking of Israel as being extremely powerful, uh, being able to carry its weight fully in the world uh, amongst the great nations, the only great democracy in that part of the world. They're used to seeing that, but old folks like myself, few of you others, remember when Israel was struggling, when after the war, it, it was just an, in its infancy, and it, it won the hearts of my generation and other generations because of the hope that it engendered. So it's a different worldview. And, 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 and you know, there's a part of me that says, I, I really do wish um, Sheikh was here because I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of commonalities, a lot of challenge and difference. In some way, the, the situation in the Middle East, especially Israel, the Jewish soul has always had a sense of great identity. Judaism has identity. Islam has identity. They have a story, they have a narrative. Palestinian ideology, and again, I, I could be going down a rabbit hole here. Probably am. I'll, I'll try tell, to stop you if yep, you do. Tell me if I, if I, <laughs> if I say something. <laughs> right? Palestinian ideology, came out of Arab nationalism in the 20s. It was capitalized by Arafat in the 60s. <clears throat> Arafat capitalized not, on, not just on Arab nationalism, but creating a Palestinian identity that did not exist before, from 68 to 88. For those that remember, Arafat addressing the United Nations in 1988 took 30 years for Israel to say, finally, you become the spokesperson of the Palestinian people because we do not negotiate with terrorism or terrorists. So what did Israel do? Or I should say, what did Arafat do? Arafat said, we recognize the state of Israel. Hamas doesn't. And remember, Hamas was democratically elected in 2005. They haven't had elections in almost 20 years. So, and even if we go back to the terminology, Palestine, there are no other religious tribal groups that are still present in that area except for the Israelites. 
the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amalekites. Don't, they, don't some of the Palestinians claim to be, if you will, descended from the Philistines? Yes. Yes. So but not, a, remember not an I, but an Ein. Right? The Philistines came out of the Sea Peoples mm -hmm. onto the coast of the Mediterranean. Most of those tribes don't exist anymore. Now, we call it Palestine, right? We know after World War I, up to the British Mandate, May 14th, 1948, it was called Palestine. What was it called before then? Syria, Palestina. That wasn't a term that we Jews gave to Israel. That was a term by the Romans. The Romans called it Syria, Palestina for almost 2,000 years, which was a throwback to Rome. So in some way, the Jewish people really have been the only indigenous people to lay claim to that area for the last 4,000 years. I will stop you there just because we're getting into a deep well of history and I want to turn to Father Joe just to get your take on the Let's college. Let's go back to college campuses for a moment. Yeah, that's where so I Pierce was going. So Pierce Morgan to. wrote an interesting article yesterday, some of you may have seen it, where he asks the question, where are the parents of these kids who are paying these huge amounts of money to send them to these schools? Where are the parents? Now, that was personal to me because my wife and I have two of our three children that are graduates of one of those schools that's been on the news so much. And that was my question. Where are the parents? Which speaks to a larger question of the breakdown of Western civilization in some ways. Our Judeo-Christian narrative holds that there are four forces that keep lawlessness at bay. One is the human conscience, the family, the spiritual community, what Christians would call the church, or in the case of Judaism, the temple community, and then the state. Well, as we watch this play out with college campuses, and it's ongoing, we can see where the breakdown occurs. It could be a family breakdown. Human conscience, what's happening? It's a question we have to wonder about in terms of the underpinnings of what creates a stable society. So I have deep concerns about what's really going on beneath the surface spiritually, um, what it means to be free, to exercise your right to protest, but at the same time, lawlessness can't be allowed. So we watch the state finally step in when the human conscience and the family and the spiritual community possibly weren't doing what they could. The state came in and has swept some of this right out. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion, but it leads me as a pastor to wonder how do we address this at the fundamental level of what's really going on? And, you know, there are a lot of perhaps answers to these issues, but one I would go back to is the question of grief. I know that to at least allow ourselves to enter the minds of our young people, they're seeing the slaughtering of humanity all over the world, mm -hmm. and it is producing grief. And sometimes we don't know how to discharge that grief. And grief can cause erratic behavior in all of us at different times as we go through grief. So I'm trying to look at this with a compassionate lens as well as one that is trying to analyze what's really happening with what could be called the breakdown of our free society. And I think it's something that is certainly a conversation that we need to have at all levels going forward. Father Joe and Rabbi, uh, are there faith leaders speaking out uh, at the national level? Are faith leaders involved on campus and because I haven't heard their voices, so tell me about it if, if you've heard these things. Well, I um, tried to get in touch with the chaplaincy office at one of these schools I mentioned where my kids went, and I think they're so overwhelmed that I didn't get a response to an email I sent. But I do understand that it's less than 1% of the population at one of these schools that is doing this. Yeah. We've got a lot of outline individuals that are trying to stir things up. So um, the answer to the question is um, I don't know. The question is, where are they getting their equipment? The students that have North Face tents and outfits and so forth, there has been a great deal of discussion about that, about certain Muslim nations perhaps supplying. I don't know if, um, if that's true or not. And, and, you know, Barbara, just to go back, uh, you know, a few years ago, when you look at Charlottesville, for example, what was the image beyond the tiki torches, right? What were the shirts that they were wearing? 
beyond, you know, some wore brown shirts, which obviously resonates a little too close to home with Nazism, right? They were wearing polo shirts. You know who created polo? A Jew. Right? Ralph Lauren. They were also wearing jeans. <laughs> Levi Strauss. Guess what? <laughs> but, but I think it, it, it poses an even greater issue, which is the lack of knowledge and the lack of understanding that people go into something. No, you're not understanding. These tents are f almost $500 mm -hmm. each one. Mm -hmm. You don't think that there's an organization or several groups that are... Uh, Funding? Sure. I do. Well, but, I, but I also think, just to go, Darcy, back on your question, which I think is an important one, we have in Reform Judaism, we have a, a whole union, okay? So we are housed under what we call the Union of Reform Judaism. We have a president, Rabbi Rick Jacobs. He has been present on Columbia campus. He has voiced his opinion. We have statements coming out from the Reform Movement or even the Conservative Movement, right? Because a lot of, I mean, A, our home base, as well as Conservative Judaism, Right? The Jewish Theological Seminary, based very close to Columbia. You also have the Union for Reform Judaism on 3rd Avenue. Right? We're all based in New York City. And I think the challenge that we see in some way is, could, should we voice our, our, our opinions? But I think what's happening is, even beyond our movements, inside our movements, there's division. So I have colleagues who are still calling for a ceasefire. I have colleagues that are calling for peace in the Middle East. And I think as a rabbi, yes, my heart goes out. I do say I want a ceasefire when 134 hostages are released. And I, think, and, I, and I will say, and I know this is a little bit off topic, but what pains me the most as a rabbi and what pains me as a Jew is how quickly the world has turned 1,200 people were ripped out of their homes by air, land, and sea. We forget that. We forget that Gilad Shalit was detained in Gaza for five years before, before a deal was broken. Every Lebanese war that we've had with Lebanon, it's the first three days the world understands. After that third day, the world turns on Israel and says, you're an aggressor. We didn't start this. Israel doesn't want war. We want peace. However, well, and I don't think the greater Muslim population wants this war. Hamas wants this war. And I will even say, my personal opinion, is that the average Palestinian wants peace with their Israeli neighbors. It's the leadership. Sinwa, Hamas who just don't care about their own people enough or see the humanity in their own people and try and do something that is favorable. What we see on college campuses is, in some way, and again, this is just my own conjecture, what we're seeing are sound bites. I'm and, hearing and something, this is the role of the I media. Am. The role of the media is critical here because you aren't even seeing anything about Gaza right now because it's all the college campuses. That makes for eyeballs on TV. We lose interest, so it's the latest shiny object, and we're led around by the nose. Father Joe, the I, I want to see if Father Joe has something to say over there. <laughs> I, I can't add much more to the college campus issue except that as much as there's mayhem and disruption, I think it's important for us to think about this emerging generation and what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, what their hopes and dreams are for this world. They recognize that they're gonna be leading this world and there's a lot of fear and deep, deep pain about what they're inheriting. And we would like to be able to pass on what we can to them by way of peace, love, and joy. It's a challenge. And us having this conversation and being prayerful and loving is about the best thing we can do right now. Okay, let me just... Um if I may just respond, because I, I, Father Joe, I absolutely agree with you. And I think in some way it is the pain, the fear, it is uh, the suffering. But I think at the same time, it's also about civility. Civility has been thrown, forgive the expression, civility has been thrown out the window. Hmm. If we could sit there, say, on the lawn of Columbia University, or any other, interesting also happens on the Ivy Leagues, and now it's trickling down. But 
beyond that. If we look at it from that area, why can't the Islamic students and the Jewish students sit in a forum respectfully and acknowledge each other's pain? Because what we're seeing is, you need to acknowledge my pain. I don't really care if I acknowledge yours. You need to feel mine. And I think that the open dialogue to be able to say, look, my heart breaks too. I am fearful. I'm scared. I have three daughters. My oldest will become bat mitzvah next weekend. There is no person in my entire family who has more of a stronger sense of Judaism than her. And what does she say? Dad, why can't both different faith groups come together and listen? We're not listening. We're telling. But it takes leadership, and on these college campuses, it would seem feasible for a rabbi, an imam, a priest, to pull their people together, to take the leadership to get kids into the same room. Is that just a pipe dream? No, 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 and, 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 and Darcy, I think, I think what's important to recognize, look, you look at areas like Columbia University or Yale or Princeton or, or uh, Penn, they all have massive Hillels. They have an institution of Jewish students. I have not seen the Hillel rabbi come out and make a statement. We haven't heard a lot of these, and maybe it is about fear. I'm afraid to open my voice for fear that I will be not verbally assaulted. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, it pains me to say this, that I could be physically assaulted. Right? You look at the rate of anti-Semitism, and again, I'm going a little bit pre-COVID, but you look at the rate of anti-Semitism in America, it is roughly 9 to 10 percent that harbor anti-Semitic feeling or tropes or what have you. Same thing is in Europe, in England. France is about 20 percent, although now I'm sure it's much higher. The chances that I, as a rabbi or as a Jew, would be accosted physically in France is very low. However, if I were Orthodox, and I mm -hmm. would wear my peyot, my peyot, and my garb. I am visibly, as for many of you saw maybe the report last week, out of London, the man who was told by the police to leave because he, of his physical appearance, could incite more violence with a pro-Palestinian protest. The chances that you would be physically harmed, visibly being Jewish, is extremely high. Why? You've got the French government that's trying to come in and inst institute law and order. You have areas in our own country where it just seems like it doesn't matter who I offend today yeah. because it goes against my own fault. But where did respect? I mean, I always go back to my movement. Uh, for those that may be familiar, Reform Judaism is the oldest centralized movement in Judaism. One of our core principles is that each and every religion is to be respected, even if we viscerally disagree. And I've had numerous conversations with Father Anderson about our differences, right? But also about our similarities. As with the sheikh, you, you and the sheikh. Right, as Father Anderson so lovingly and appropriately says, right? Who was Christians, Christianity's Lord and Savior? A man who was born a Jew, circumcised a Jew, you all can figure it out, and died a Jew. Well, if that's the case, why is it that we have such division? Can't we see the common core principles? It's not by accident that we call them Judeo-Christian values. We share the same compassion for one another. Why can't we implement it? Why can't we sit here or the leaders that need to be on college campuses and say, turn the temperature down. I think it takes uh, concrete action on our own part. We've talked about getting together for gleaning or for various other kinds of things, going down to the Al-Hikmat Center, which is it's quite a haul. We'd have to get a, a bus to do it. 
but building on those kinds of relationships, uh, not just at the top, but one-on-one. -on -one. I think, I, think, I think part of it too is also Israel doesn't want to go down that route or to be able, I mean, in, look, in some way, Israel has tried to shelter those families from the pain of what's going on. In some way, I think, yes, in some way, yes, my heart says, let the world see, because the world doesn't see it. And look, I watch the news every day. I see the plight of Palestinians. My heart goes out to them, I do. But then stand up. Stand up and talk to your leadership and say, enough. What are we afraid of? They're going to take your life? They're going to do it anyway. And in some way, it's about the strong sense of leadership. We go back to the 1960s, which I will say I was not alive or even thought of. But if you go back to the 1960s, where was race relations? Where was civil rights? Where, where did it make its impact? Now, I know I'm gonna effectively have a few words here that others could disagree with. I'm gonna say it didn't happen in the courts. It happened in the churches. It happened in the synagogues. It was the conviction of our pastors and our priests and our rabbis and our imams who stood up and said, we can't marginalize a people for what they look like. You need to be able to see them as human beings. And I'll add to that, that in those protest movements, they were absolutely nonviolent and non-resisting. So if you broke the law, you paid for it. You didn't hit and club other people. You simply took the medicine. Uh, that's not happening on campuses today. This is not nonviolence. This is dog eat dog, frankly. Well, look at that! Oh my God! <laughs> Jehovah Jireh! God provides. So we change the heat and put it over here now. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get roasted, buddy. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. However, I will take up some of the questions that were submitted to me for you. One of the most uh, pertinent of which, several questioners submitted verses drawn from the Quran that encourage extreme violence against people who do not follow Islam. Now, as we said last week, the Holy Bible has plenty of violence in it, and Canaanites and Amalekites uh, being annihilated with God's blessing. But in terms of the Quran, I'll just give one example that was cited. It's uh, Quran chapter 9, verse 5. Slay the unbelievers wherever you find them and take them captive and besiege them and lie in wait for them in every ambush. It was also asserted that violence against women is rife throughout many Muslim countries. Uh, several people cited chapter 4, verse 34 of the Quran as permitting the beating of women if they persist in being disobedient. All that I say is background. The question, there were two. How do you reconcile the verses that promote violence and the violence of the Prophet's own life, at least his earlier period, with Islam being a religion of peace? I know, it's hard. So first of all, I, I really got to apologize. You know, it's strange that today I left half an hour earlier than I left the last two weeks. I'm not kidding. But I mean, my friend with me here will tell you it was a total crash. The, the car was on pieces. Mm. And uh, the highway was totally shut down at one mile before stored exits. I was right here. So that was a sad part. But uh, finally they got things off and... Um, 
thank you for yeah, pushing yeah. through. I thought I would reach here earlier today, so I'd have eaten lunch half an hour before. But you're here. But I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Thank you very much. I just didn't want to miss it. I didn't want to miss it. So I thought, reach a few minutes earlier, at least we're here. So basically, you know, with all these questions about the Quran and violence, a short answer, a very short answer. Yes, we said before that there were what you call defense, wars in defense. And these verses are directly to do with people who attacked the Prophet, peace be upon him, and their people in those days. Particularly in the beginning. In of the beginning of times. Ministry. Very clear. In the beginning of times, people who wanted to kill them, and I think I said that before sometime here, just as the people wanted to kill Jesus, you know, in Islam, we don't believe that Jesus died. That's a whole different question. But from Christianity, they wanted to kill him for the same reason, preaching the word of God. You know, Abraham, they would throw him in the fire. They wanted to kill him. Moses, Pharaoh, and the armies wanted to kill him when he was leaving with the Israelites. So that's the whole reason why in Islam, the permissibility is there that those who attacked you and want to kill you, you had the rights and the permissibility to defend yourself. That's directly. But even in those same verses, if you go back and you check, you will see where the Quran continues to say, and if those people stop attacking you, you check it out, you'll see it right there. And the same with the wife, too. Yes. If she starts obeying... <laughs> if they... Oh well, no, we'll get to that. If the same people stop attacking you, then it's better for you, the Quran says, to forgive them, to work with them, to be nice with them, to be loving with them. It directly says that, together with the, the permissibility to defend yourself. Actually, there were people in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and you could go check it out, not just one, many cases, and because of time we won't elaborate too long. You could research that. People who killed, like the uncle of the Prophet, peace be upon him, friends, relatives, whatever, Afterwards, they came and accepted Islam. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, had no choice but to forgive them. And the, some of his companions were like, so what happened? These so these weren't forced conversions? No, 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 no. These were people on their, in their own hearts. They decided, we want to come to Islam. We want to join your faith. And the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, would tell him, but these people did such harms to you. And he would say, I was sent as a mercy to humanity. I have no choice but to forgive them. And he will grant them forgiveness, direct people who killed their, their relatives and, and, and the believers. In the case with the wife, this was about a wife who is not just uh, trying to get her to obey you. It's a wife who is disloyal, did certain things. Da, 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 da. And the verse was all about warning. Now, in some translation, the verse does say, it's an Arabic word which means, which is like, Isrib. It means, it does not only mean literally to beat. No, no, no. It meant set forth, set straight, set correct. Um, that if she decides to go against you, if she decides to leave you, have a different relationship with someone, then, you know, stop sleeping. Exactly like what you see in a, in a court divorce case here. You got steps. And then the very same verse tells you again, and if she decides to stop doing whatever she is doing, then feel free, forgive, forget, and live together. You've got even that choice and command that you should forgive and make her back if there is this problem. So that interpretation or that word of beat, some people translate it because, you know, in English or like any other language, it literally can have many different meanings for words. Okay. But it did not really mean physically beat because many a times when you see even the guys who translate it, they will say beat lightly. So it's like, what is beat lightly? Mm. So some people said they translated those who believe you should beat if you and your wife have these problems. And it was directly to it, a wife having another relationship with someone else mm. and being with mm. you. Their, their, their laws were like um, beat with the size of a pen. How could you beat someone with this? So it's technically, it's technically like Jesus telling the people who committed no sin, you cast the first stone. 
Oh, you know, so it, how could you tell someone beat with a pen? What beat is that? It's like te technically, there is no evidence that the prophet, peace be upon him, beat any of his wives. He had nine, eleven wives. Nine or eleven wives. Busy guy. So it does not exist. It's a, it's a translation or interpretation that has been misinterpreted. Okay, one more question along those lines. Um, for faithful Muslim followers, you have those two sets of verses, if you will. They're the ones that came to the Prophet while he was in Mecca and experiencing a lot of opposition, uh, threats, and so forth, and the verses that came to him at Medina when he was in more of a settled community, he had many more followers, was in a more stable position. The two uh, volumes, if you will, of verses still exist in the Quran, just like our Bible has violent verses, peaceful ones. Can a good Muslim just focus on the more peaceful ones and still be faithful to Allah? Or is, I mean, you have uh, Hamas citing horrible verses from the Quran to justify their actions because they are in the Quran. How do you deal with that as a faithful Muslim? You, how do you regard the violent verses? So you are supposed to take the peaceful way. People like Hamas and ISIS and Al-Qaeda, they deliberately go back into that context of those issues that happened then and they use those verses to justify their decision. Are they denounced by other of Muslim course, they, leaders? Not by other, they're denounced by the majority. They're, that's why By leaders too? Everybody, that's why they have, you know, Bin Laden is a very good example. Listen, Bin Laden is from Saudi Arabia. You all know that if you check him out. And because Saudi Arabia denounced him, that's why he left. He wanted his own way in Saudi Arabia, his own extremism and fundamental yeah, radicalism way. And that's why he had to leave because he could not get his own way. Mm -hmm. I mean, and Saudi, which is such a strong, strict country in their areas and ways, um, he being from them, they did not tolerate him. And that's enough to let you know that the rest of the world, uh, you know, it's not like that. Unfortunately, I know because we're here in the media, and plus we do have a lot of radical Muslims who voice, uh, I like to call it stupidity, uh, publicly and quietly, and they misrepresent Islam, unfortunately. But wherever you go, you will see where the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he came and conquered Mecca from Medina, when he came back with everybody, this is in the history books, and he conquered Mecca. Again, the people told him, okay, get back to these people who harmed you and chased you and did everything when you were here. He said, no, that's not my mission. The Quran only permits if someone is coming to kill you. As I said previously here, it's like a police or a soldier or law enforcement person. Uh, someone is coming to kill you. Self-defense. You've got the right for self-defense. But every verse that the Quran speaks about that, every time that that issue happened in the past, the forgiveness always comes after. But it is better for you to forgive. But if they don't, then you treat them with love, with kindness and harm. That was the direct mission. And there is no defense to it. There is no ifs and buts about it. Those are just laws. Those are not laws for us to practice today. Those are references of what used to happen then. Okay. So it's not about that you have to go ISIS way and Al-Qaeda way. You're not supposed to go those ways. These are incidents that happened in those days that is referred to in the Quran. So you would almost compare it to the verses about the Amalekites and the Canaanites uh, when God said that those tribes were harem and everything should be destroyed. It's almost like the Jews don't pick out those verses in order to uh, justify murder or something. Of course, so, so that, that's the point. So it's tho those days and those times when they were harmed, when you were harmed, that's when you had to do it. But it doesn't mean you're going to use that for everybody nowadays. You cannot. You know, we, we, are so, we are strong followers of Joseph, peace be upon him. Prophet, we call him Prophet Yusuf. Look at how he dealt with his brothers when they left and they came to Egypt. 
he and his brothers, yes. he forgave them. He gave them shelter. He gave them food. He lived with them with love. That's the Quran tells you. Go check it out. It tells you that's the most beautiful chapter in the Quran. That that's the ideal. Every one of you, you that's go the check. Ideal. Go check chapter twelve. It's called Joseph from the Torah and the Bible. And the Quran said this is the most beautiful story in the Quran. It begins like that, and then it tells you how loving, how kind, how forgiving Joseph was to his brothers who wanted to kill him. Oh, we want him. to hear more of that yeah. in this world. I do have uh, another question about women. It was said in our first session that women and men are separated at the mosque and other gatherings because men would be distracted if women were just right there in front of their eyes. And this person said, isn't this a way of indulging men in their weakness rather than addressing the issue and holding men to a higher standard of self-discipline and self-restraint? I mean, that's a, a, a wonderful question, and that makes a lot of sense, makes a lot of sense. But you got to go with what is called reality. You know, reality is, reality is, that's the nature of men. It's not that Islam went with the weakness of men. It's just human nature. But we in the Episcopal Church can all sit together, and I don't think I'm being leered at. Or not, not, well, you know, again, you may be that exceptional person. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> you know, it's like the traffic light. I always look at places. If you come down, down here in nice little quiet areas, there's no traffic lights. Mm -hmm. It's just a stop sign. Right? So traffic lights are really for bad drivers. <laughs> Think about it. Well, why should we accommodate all those bad drivers? We should not have traffic lights. For regular calm places, you stop, let the other person go. You go, and everybody, four-way junction, there's only a stop sign. There are some places you drive in little residential areas, there are not even a stop sign. It's all about love and give way to the other. But because of the, 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 the kind of driving that you have on the road, you've got to have major stop signs. In New York, in some areas, the light's got to blink twice. The yellow light's got to blink twice to give you caution, stop, stop. So, you know, the caution is the thing. It's all about the, the caution in Islam. It's about the human nature. I mean, we've got to go through history. What has happened? Men, men really oppressed. And do you know, these laws, and I, I'm really not kidding, these laws are always in the benefit of women, you know. It's for the security of women and the caring of women that men, it looked as though it was for the rights of men and men had the upper hand. Oh, no, 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 no. It's all about the rights and the protection of women because women were abused, they were used, they were refused in the days before, they were taken advantage of. And a lot of these laws that came about in Islam was to really care for them, you know, care more for them, put more security in place for them, because it doesn't matter what you do. Some of these men, you cannot harness. They're going to still have their bad ways. It's like crime in the world today. It doesn't matter what you do in America, all the security we have, you still got to have things in place for crime, because that's an unfortunate nature of human beings. Human, oh, all right. It just happened to be that way. Muslim human beings. You know, you know one thing. Muslim men. Yes. One thing <laughs> I gotta say that I didn't probably share before. You know, in Makkah, the men were very harsh, very harsh. When they came to Medina, they became very calm. Now the men in Mecca used to laugh of them and say, "Oh, you men, your wives are ruling you." Mm. It's not that. It's that they became more loving. They became more caring they became more forgiving and they give more weight to their wives. Yeah, you can say whatever you want. You know, the wife is... The wife, I always say the wife is like the neck. The man says he's the head of the house, but the neck turns the head whichever direction she wants. <laughs> so that's the concept in Islam. You can be the head to be in control for authority, for security. That's what it is all about. But your wife is like a neck. She has a right to tell you what you eat, what you don't eat, what you dress, what you don't dress, how you dress. So your, your wife is very good at letting you have her own way. You know, when I'm home, <laughs> not, not just her own way. When I'm home, my wife have all the way. When I'm outside, I'm on my own way. 
<laughs> That's uh, Darcy, um, yes. I'd like yes. to say one thing, which is I think about our commonalities and our differences. I can speak for the Episcopal Church, and by the way, I was asked by someone at the table, what's the difference between the Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church? And I said, it's one word, authority. In the Catholic Church, you look to the Pope. In the Episcopal Church or the Anglican ethos, you look to scripture, tradition, and reason. Now, tradition moves very slowly, but it does move. And as Anglicans, we've always been very comfortable engaging the secular culture, whether it be literature, history, the sciences, even sociology and psychology. So for us, the role of women shifted and continues to shift mm. based upon tradition being sort of permeable and flexible and reason informing that. So there was a time when the Episcopal Church did not ordain women. In the 1970s, that changed. Now we even have female bishops. Uh, the role of women for us is an ongoing fluid conversation. So I just note that difference. We don't just look at scripture, we look at other sources too. Very good point. Uh, one of the questioners said from his observation that uh, in predominantly Muslim countries, women often do not have the same rights, equal rights before the law as men. I was looking at this and the one country that was cited that did have absolutely equal rights was Tunisia. Others were lower down the scale in terms of inheritance, uh, not allowing polygamy, um, allowing a, a Muslim woman to marry a non-Muslim man and so forth, just and in business and educational opportunities and so forth. Can you speak to that? Is, is equality before the law more widespread or is it it's very uh, scattered throughout the Muslim world? Actually, equality is supposed to be there and is supposed in the Quran, to exist it was, in yes. the Quran and in the Muslim world. But I must have mentioned this before here or somewhere else. Again, again, unfortunately, I mean, sometimes we want to blame Satan, huh? We got to blame Satan that maybe he influenced men. <laughs> Unfortunately, we got to say that. But it's just that men like to use this, this authority mm. and this way of taking advantage of women. But women do have... Sometimes I don't even think... If you were to ask me my opinion about Islam and women, I don't even think it's equal. I think women have more rights than men. It's beyond women have... It's not just equal. Women are even more. They got more rights, more choices, more opportunity in Islam than men. So if I say equality, I'll be doing injustice. But unfortunately, because of that, and do you know, I, I, I always, in my lectures, I tell the woman, the Muslim woman, I say one of the reasons for this is because you guys don't study your religion. Mm. And if you study the scriptures, you will see how much rights you got. And because you don't know your rights, that's why the men take advantage of you. Mm. They take advantage of you. You know, in Islam, a girl went to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And this is all in the books. You guys can go check it out. And she said, oh, messenger of God, my father forced me to get married. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said marriage is not valid. So... You, you, a, a father or mother can't even get their daughter married without her consent and her permission. You know, once upon a time, people used to force to get married due to wealth, due to status, due to kingdom, due to royalty, all this sort of corruption. But Islam has a law on the day of the marriage, if that bride does not say, I accept, there's no marriage. She has more rights than the, the man in Islam in all different ways. is not even equality. And so I like she that should question. learn to exert her rights. She needs to learn. That's what the problem is. The, she, and, and Islam says, there's a verse, there's a saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that knowledge is compulsory on men and women equally. Education. It's education. So she, if she educates herself, she will see her rights and how she has more rights than, than men. We've reached our time. Uh, and I know there are questions out there. There are many questions that uh, we could ask, but w we are out of time. So I, I want to uh, tell you one thing that a dear friend wrote in that I thought might be worth closing with, and then I'll have one. Would, would you close us in prayer afterward? Sure. Thank you. Assuming each of us in attendance here is on a spiritual journey to get to know a loving God, could we agree 
to pray each day to our God, to treat every person we meet with reverence, and to finding peaceful ways to resolve our differences. As people of faith, our combined prayers are powerful. We can begin to be the change that we want to see in the world. And that would be a prayer I think we all could pray. But now I'm going to ask Rabbi Matthew to close us in prayer. Before I do so. <laughs> I, I, I just want to make this clear as well from a Judaic perspective, because I think there's a lot uh, between a sheikh and, 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 and Judaism, uh, Islam and Judaism, right? In some way, we could say the same thing, right? They could say, well, in Judaism, women are less than. Not true. A man is required. There are requirements based on males. For females, there's not the requirement, but if a woman so chooses, she is allowed. Now, let me give you an example, because I think this one's quite powerful. For those that are familiar with the Jewish phylacteries, known as tefillin, on our forearm and our forehead, right? we bind ourselves with the commandments. Way back in the day, 900 some odd years ago, almost a thousand years ago, out of France, one of our beloved commentators, Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchak, asked the same question. Show me where it says a woman cannot. It doesn't. What it does say is a man is required. So almost a thousand years ago in France, Rashi's daughters put on tefillin. Hmm. Juxtaposed it a thousand years later, Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, who was the founder of Reconstructionist Judaism in America, said to his colleagues, show me where it says a woman cannot read from Torah. It does not. It says a woman may not if she is during menstrual cycles. Okay, we can understand that, especially historically and through the laws of ritual purity. So he pushed. And lo and behold, in 1922, Judith Kaplan became the first female in this country to publicly read the Torah off the pulpit. So in some way, I think there's a lot of similarity. As I'm sure, as I know, there is a lot of similarity between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. We may differ. This is me now going into the prayer. We may differ in our understanding, in our biblical narratives, but we all share the same value, the sanctity of human life, mm. the love of one another, the ability, if we so have the ability, to welcome others in our midst with a free and open hand, to support our communities. And taking a look around here, the fact that we have started these Lunch and Learn series and have served thousands and thousands of meals for all of us to partake in. With thanks to John Norris and his team. Absolutely. Right. That's me taking over for a minute. Yes. <laughs> but it's also not by accident that these series have been called Breaking Bread. I wanted breaking challah, but, <laughs> right? but we break bread together because food is intimate. It's a holy act, whether we are Muslim, whether we are Jewish, or whether we are Christian. My prayer and my hope, may we be able to take the knowledge and the experience that we've taken from these many sessions May we use them in our own communities. May we be able to be thinking for ourselves, be mutually respectful for everyone in our communities. But most importantly, may we always pray, always pray for peace, mm. peace of mind, peace of body, and peace of soul. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. You've been a wonderful group. 
and very patient. Thank you, Sheikh, for pushing through to arrive here today. I'm sorry I we really couldn't. Have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are many thank questions you, Darcy, that for remain. Thank you, being our referee. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I really thought I would have been here half an hour earlier, but could you imagine the road shut down? I'm like, wow. But, you know, God wanted us to be here, so we made it. Thank we you. We made it. Thank you. Thank you, Father Joe. <laughs> Well, you go ahead and ask him. Oh, thank you. It's sort of like the proverbial duck, you know, floating up, smooth on the surface, paddling like hell underneath. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I'm happy. Just send those questions in. I mean, just continue sending them in because they'll be the basis for our next Lunch and Learn. So in other words, <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I couldn't.